Thank you all. Now all we need was Josh Groban to sing that with him. I want to welcome you to our worship today on this nice, cool, sunny day. Hopefully you got here without too much sweat. Um, you get out of the shower, unfortunately. It feels like, why did I even bother? But anyway, let's take a few moments to quiet our minds and open our hearts to God's Spirit as we worship God. Please join me in our call to worship. God calls. God, has. God challenges. God, moves. God liberates. God saves. Guide us and our lives, O Holy One, so all creation might flourish. Let us worship. Please join me in singing, Come Christians, join to sing number. 267.
Please join me in our confession of sin. The truth is liberating. Let us honestly examine our hearts and confess our sins before God. Holy God, we belittle ourselves. Christ has set us free. Claim your forgiveness. Rejoice in God's grace. Respond with bold, courageous love. Amen. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please welcome your neighbors sharing the peace of Christ with them. Our first reading is Psalm 24. It is a worship song that would be sung as people entered the temple. Listen for God's word to us today. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false, and do not swear deceitfully. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. 
He is the King of Glory. Okay. This is the word of the Lord. letter to the Ephesians is a complicated letter to read. It's filled with really long run-on sentences. In fact, our reading today is made up of only four sentences in the original Greek. This morning we read from chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Twelve verses, but only four sentences. That makes it difficult to follow the author's logic. So instead, I decided to use a paraphrase. I decided to read from The Message by Eugene Peterson. Instead of trying to read it as four really long sentences, Peterson breaks it into four paragraphs of seven, five, two, and two sentences, respectively. Each paragraph represents one sentence in the original Greek. Let's listen to what God has to say to us in this passage today. How blessed is God, and what a blessing He is. He's the Father of our Master, Jesus Christ, and takes us to the high places of blessing in Him. Long before He laid down earth's foundations, He had us in mind. He had settled on us as the focus of His love, to be made whole and holy by His love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift-giving by the hand of his beloved son. That's one sentence. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross. We're free people free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all our misdeeds. And not just barely free either, abundantly free. He thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need, letting us in on the plans he took such delight in making. He set it all before us in Christ, a long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him, everything in deepest heaven, everything on planet earth it's in christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for long before we first heard of christ and got our hopes up he had his eye on us had designs on us for glorious living part of the overall purpose he's working out in everything and everyone it is in christ that you once you heard the truth and believed it this message of salvation found yourselves home free, signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. This signet from God is the first installment on what's coming, a reminder that we'll get everything God has planned for us, a praising and glorious life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As I mentioned, the letter is a difficult one. We just read a lot of information in what was four sentences in the original Greek. However, when we read it, it's some pretty amazing stuff if you think about it. I wanted to use the paraphrase because what we read is too good to have it get lost in translation. There are two main themes of the section. First, The agency of Christ. It is because of Jesus Christ that all of the blessing mentioned are ours. The second is that God is the one who initiated it all. First, Christ as the agent of God's purpose informs this entire passage. Because of Christ, we have been given spiritual blessings. We have been chosen. And not only chosen, but chosen to be God's children. As we read, long before he laid down earth's foundations, 
He had us in mind. He settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, God decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. And not only did God choose us, we're told that God took pleasure in choosing us. We are retold that we are the recipients of God's grace. We don't deserve it, but God loves us anyway. No matter what we've done, no matter how much we've messed up our lives, God loves us anyway. The good news of the gospel is not forgiveness of sin. It's God's unconditional love for all of us. And John 3.16 is probably the most well-known verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. But we usually stop there. And I think we do the verse a disservice by not including the next verse, which says, Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The world, all of the world. Since we've looked at how Peterson paraphrased our second reading from Ephesians, let's see how he handles these two verses. He writes, This is how much God loved the world. He gave his Son, his one and only Son, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Through Jesus Christ, we are the recipients of God's unconditional love and forgiveness. Wow. That's awesome. In addition, the author tells us that we've been given knowledge of God's purposes. In Jesus, we see God's plan for humanity. We see God's love for all creation. All of this has come to us because of Jesus Christ. Secondly, the author never forgets that it's God's initiative that has caused all this. We read it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living, part of the overall purpose he's working out in everything and everyone. Before we were ever born, before Jesus Christ ever showed up on this earth, God had it all planned out. God chose me, and God chose you. It doesn't get any better than that. One of my colleagues often used an expression that I will never forget as long as I live. It's one of my favorites. She said, Jesus loves me, and there's nothing I can do about it. Jesus loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter how you live your life, Jesus loves you anyway. God chose me, and God chose you. Now this part of Ephesians has a special place in my heart. It's a, pas a passage that shows us how truly blessed we are. And it hits home for me in two very specific ways. First, that through Jesus we have been adopted by God into God's family. You see, adoption is something that's very special to me. I was adopted. As soon as I was old enough to understand, my mom told me about the fact that I was adopted and how special I was. She told me the story about she and my dad got married three weeks before he was sent off to Fort Smith, Arkansas, and then went overseas with General Patton. 
So by the time he got back, they found out eventually that they couldn't have children. But at that point, they were in their early 30s, which in those days was too old to adopt a child. It's not the way we look at it today, but back then that was too old. So it took them, ironically, eight years to find some place that would let them adopt. So now they're 40 years old. But they found me in Lackawanna, New York, in an orphanage connected with a hospital named Father Baker's. The orphanage was named Our Lady of Victory. I was three weeks old, and they brought me home. And as I said, my mom, as soon as I was able to understand it, told me, and told me how that meant I was blessed because I was chosen. She told me about how much it took them to find me. And then in school, as kids often will do, somebody found out that I was adopted, so they decided to tease me about it. Somehow, some way, I don't know where I got the expression, but my response whenever they teased me was, that's okay, my parents picked me, yours didn't have any choice. That shut them up right then and there. Adoption is not to be something to be teased about. Adoption is a good thing. It means that my parents went to a lot of trouble to get me and make me a part of their family. Just like God went to a lot of trouble in Jesus Christ to make us a part of God's family. The second thing that hits me from this passage is how the passage shows how special we are to God. In our passage, Peterson wrote that we were so special that God took pleasure in planning all this. You see, like many children, I learned I wasn't good enough. In fact, I spent most of the first 35 years of my life feeling like I wasn't good enough. Unfortunately, I learned from some of the nuns in Catholic school that I attended as a kid that not only did we kids do bad things, but we were bad. Many times I've told people I feel like the prodigal son. I was home, I've been forgiven, and I'm at the party, but I'm not enjoying myself because I don't feel like I belong at the party. I don't feel like I deserve to be at the party. That's worse than guilt. That's shame. And that's hard to get through. It's a horrible way to live. But before we go off on the Catholic Church, that experience was not limited to the Catholic Church. Many Protestant churches as well looked at us in the same way. There are many children and now adults who have been scarred by their experiences with the church over the last 2,000 years. I was scarred by this, so much so that I left the church at the first opportunity I got. When I was 16 and went off two years early to college, I quit going to church, and I stopped for the next 18 years. But I was lucky. After my mom died, I decided that there was something missing in my life, and that something was church. I decided that I needed church, so I decided to give church another chance. But not the church I grew up in. There was a Presbyterian church around the corner from my house that I could walk to. And I say I was lucky because this time I found a church that allowed me to read the Bible for myself instead of telling me what it said. I found a church that allowed me to see how blessed I truly was. I found a church that showed me I truly was good enough. Not only was I good enough, but I was special to the one who created it all. I was special to God. Maybe the better way to put it is that I was blessed. God had been watching over me all of those years. And when I was ready to come home, just like the prodigal son, the father was just waiting and rushed out to welcome me home. The father loved me enough that he ran to welcome me home before I even asked for forgiveness. Paul wrote it this way, but God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
So this is a really difficult passage to read. It's difficult because of the amount of stuff that is packed into four really long sentences. But when you break it down into little pieces, it opens up to give you an amazing picture. It's a picture of how much God loves us. It's a picture of what God was willing to do to show us that love. It's a picture of God's plan for the world and how it played out in the person of Jesus Christ. It's a picture of blessing. It's a picture of our adoption into God's family. It's a picture of how important we are to God's plan for the redemption of the world. That's one of the core tenets of Christianity. We are special to God. We have been chosen by God. If we read further in the letter to the Ephesians, in two, chapter 2, verse 8, we read, For God by grace you have been given sa that you have been saved by faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Or as Peterson puts it, saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from the start to finish. We don't play the major role. We are loved. We have been chosen. We are special. We have been adopted as God's children. And that's a good thing. All we have to do is trust God enough to let God do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. Amen. Please join me in number 14, For the Beauty of the Earth. We will sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 5. Join me now in our affirmation of sin, reading together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, 
of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We come now to our time when we celebrate our faith in action. Uh, just an announcement. Oh, please be seated. Sorry. Uh, we come now to that time when we share things together with what's going on. Um, the deacons will meet after worship today, correct? Um, and also, Susan Dietz has some information to share to you about her experience with General Assembly. Good morning. Rather than just explaining the Presbyterian Outlook's interpretations of the actions of the General Assembly this morning that you can find in your bulletin, I am choosing to focus on the faces of General Assembly. We live in a world that identifies the faces and lives of people with lists and with labels. On Wednesday of the Assembly, Reverend Ruth West spoke during opening service of worship on the world's and sometimes our denomination's insistence on classifying people with lists and labels, she reminded, all of his children are made in the image of God. That should be good enough. We don't need a list. We don't need labels. Her words, in so many ways, summarize the work of the 226th General Assembly. GA truly was a gathering of God's children who are created in his image. God went to the garden to create animals. He went to the sea to create the creatures, but he looked within himself to create us. We are his image. The actions of the Presbyterian Church USA's General Assembly serve as a reminder that all are welcome to be called to ministry. All are welcome to the church and all are God's children. Faces representing our denomination's commitment to the preservation of God's world guided numerous actions of GA. Our mission responsibility through investment agency brought to light their efforts to divest from bonds invested in companies financing Israel's occupation of Palestine, as well as their focus on continuing corporate engagement with those who disregard their role in the climate crisis. Hours were spent in response to the action of companies who gain a majority of their profits from fossil fuels. From the plea for Presbyterians at all levels to stop using one-time dinnerware to lithium mining impact awareness, there are things needing our attention. We can be assured that there are faces at all levels of our denomination who are committed to these no-time-to-waste world issues. The faces made in the image of God in attendance at General Assembly at times were heartbreaking. A Korean Presbyterian woman pastor who cannot be acknowledged and is often called wife rather than pastor. LGBTQIA people who have left our denomination to find a safer place or been, de or been denied their call as pastors when seeking congregational employment. The woman of color sitting in front of me weeping when our denomination Center for the Repair of Historical Harms was given the task of revisiting our denomination's often in intentional harm against her ancestors. The adolescent transvestite sharing how much their local Presbyterian congregation had loved them and how the ladies still give them cookies, but how the state of Utah laws continuously shame them. The young man who lost his four-year-old cousin to gun violence just days before arriving as a delegate. Not only were the voices of these people heard, 
but the actions of your GA also confirm that our denomination is truly listening. In a time when acceptance is not always the case in God's churches, it is affirming to know that our denomination is becoming aware of the image of God found in all who enter our sanctuaries. I am one of the faces of your General Assembly. GA is not something I did or something I attended in the past tense. I see my commission as GA to, as a future tense, as a challenge to put my faith work clothes on. I'll gladly meet with our session concerning the overtures, arrival at our presbyteries for vote, or share the denomination's concerns related to local con congregations investments. I can share why your per, per capita contribution that sustains the work of our denomination will increase 59 cents in 2025 in response to the actions of GA. So start saving up now. I experience and would love to share doable paperless ideas for those who serve meals and tend to worship services. During our commission on preparation for ministry's next meeting, I will foster discernment regarding the decision to withhold ordination from those who are unwilling to allow full participation of people based on their gender or sexual orientation, as well as the other overture actions of our ordination committee presented to GA. My fellow commissioners and I will report at the August Presbytery meeting and serve on the Presbytery of Scioto Valley Bills and Overtures Committee for the next two years. Live into hope was the theme of the 2026 General Assembly, the 226th General Assembly. The Holy Spirit was at work to instill the hope in those in attendance. We have all heard the chatter that the Presbyterian Church is dying. The Salt Lake City GA was just not a gathering of a dying church. I witnessed a vibrant church with lively, thoughtful youth advisors, faith-revealing seminary student advisors, teaching elders who left their young children to attend, and ruling elders who use vacation time to attend. I encountered memorable Presbyterians from all corners of God's earth, and I also encountered the dancing in the aisles. A new sense of hope, a new sense of church, is emerging. Congregations are challenged to be the faces of the emerging, vibrant denomination. And in addition, we are reminded that synods, presbyteries, agencies, and affiliates continuously are the face of those committed to the work of our denomination and always present to guide us. If, it, if I did not know that before General Assembly, I certainly know it now. I cannot, nor will I, I will not forget the faces of 226 General Assembly. I have lived, especially in the last three years of my life, by the words of Job 11:18, Having hope will give you courage. It is time for us to live in the hope and to act in the courage needed to keep our churches and our denomination vibrant. Now, my siblings in Christ, Pray for our denomination, pray for our leaders, pray for our church, pray for our country. May God continue to challenge and bless our congregation. May we be the face of God to all we meet. Amen. I was a commissioner at the 225th General Assembly, and I know how much work and effort and prayer goes into representing your local presbytery. So I personally want to thank Susan for the work she did and for all of those who worked so hard with this General Assembly. In gratitude to God for our blessings, let us bless others with a portion of all we have been given. Let us present our offerings to God.
Most generous God, you have blessed us with gifts to serve and share. May the offerings we present today be used to promote the peace, justice, and healing you desire for us and for our, our world. Amen. Please be seated. Come now to our celebration of joys and also presentation of our concerns. First of all, obviously, we want to keep Donald Trump and those who were affected by the shooting yesterday in our prayers. Uh, no matter what political party you belong to, no matter whether you like Donald Trump or don't like Donald Trump, there is no place for the kind of anger that we have in our country these days. And we need to pray that it ends. Unfortunately, I don't think it will. I think the political parties will continue to keep the fire burning uh, up until, at least up until the election. So please pray for the country. We need it. Other joys and concerns? Oh, this is Martha Tripp, uh, for those who are watching online. Um, I am thankful, I am joyful about vegetables. Um, <laughs> in Westminster House, someone left some zucchinis. Um, there is a pepper, a green, lovely green pepper, and some little tomatoes from our garden out back. And John Graham dropped off some really nice big tomatoes. So stop by uh, Westminster and get some vegetables. others. Let's turn to God in prayer. God of heaven and earth, in these days of scorching summer sun and cool evening breeze, of terrorizing wars and vacations at the beach, of discouraging national news and nourishing church potlucks. We live lives of contradictions. We notice the disparity. We feel you tugging at our hearts to heed Christ's call of discipleship, of care, of service, and delighting in blessings bestowed. We pray this day for our country that we might find some way to get past the anger, to get past making every issue a political issue, to get past that which threatens to tear this country apart. On this Sabbath day, we pause to pray for those who are suffering, those who are close and known to us, as well as those who live in faraway foreign lands, in your mercy, God, hear our prayers for people seeking to survive enduring violence in Ukraine, Gaza, and Sudan. For people seeking a home to call their own, a place of safety and refuge. For people seeking escape from record heat waves, tropical storms, and natural disasters. For people seeking a cure for disease or the easing of physical pain. For people seeking relief from endless waves of grief. For people seeking spiritual peace to the cool, the anger burning within them. And people seeking healing from mental or physical illness. God, we know that we are not powerless. We recognize the power we hold to make this world more just, more equitable, and more right. Equip us, teacher, with the wisdom to know what is best and the courage to do what is right. And now as the body of Christ, hear us as we pray the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me now as we sing, Just As I Am Without One Plea, number 442. Brothers and sisters, God calls, Christ loves, and the Spirit guides. Just as God gathered us this day for worship, God sends us out, redeemed, renewed, ready to live and love faithfully. May the grace, hope, and peace and love of God, the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer be with us all this day and every day. Amen.
Mm-hmm.